everyone and welcome back. We are getting there. I think we're about kind of halfway through at this point. Um, and I want to turn our attention further south to what we might think of as the modern day Virginia, the Shenandoah Valley, a little bit further south um, and southwest. So at the same time that there's a lot going on on the Ohio River and up by Pittsburgh, there's also the House of Burgesses meeting in Williamsburg. And among these men in the House of Burgesses uh, are two brothers, Charles Lewis and Andrew Lewis. Charles represents Augusta County. Andrew represents Botetourt County. And they are also the county lieutenants for their respective uh, militias. And they're very experienced with warfare. You know, they're competent men. And in his later memoirs, Captain John Stewart, he kind of tells us how all this went down around this time. He says that while the brothers were in Williamsburg, a letter arrived from Fort Pitt talking about the hostile appearance of the Shawnee. And this might be the same circular letter that uh, had kind of caused problems to start up by Fort Pitt. Maybe the same letter that led to the Yellow Creek Massacre. Um, but whether it's the same or whether it's a different variety of the same nonsense, is still John Connolly doing what John Connolly does. And the governor calls in the Lewis brothers and he meets with them to discuss it and together they come up with a plan of action. Now mind you, the letter they received claimed that uh, white traders had been murdered by the Shawnee. So they think there's actual uh, loss of life and they at this point probably haven't heard about the Yellow Creek Massacre either. Um, or if they have, they think of it as kind of like a separate thing going on. So they are convinced that the Shawnee are at war and that they're actually getting valuable intel from Connolly, even though we know that's kind of laughable. Um, but anyway, so the plan is that Andrew Lewis is going to lead a southern division, march up the Kanawha River uh, to what is now Point Pleasant, West Virginia. And this southern division is going to be men from Augusta, Botetourt, and Fincastle counties. Then at the, around the same time, Dunmore is going to lead a northern division. And this is men from Shenandoah County, Frederick County, and the area around Fort Pitt that Dunmore had labeled West Augusta. So, you know, that's their plan. They're going to meet up at Point Pleasant, and there they're going to build a fort for the protection of the frontier. Um, and then after they finish that fort, the plan was, you know, they might go across the river and they might retaliate for these deaths that they think have occurred. Again, we know that's nonsense. They didn't know that was nonsense. And also along the way, when Dunmore does eventually march, he kind of picks up some strays and he gets men from Maryland and Pennsylvania too. But there's this perception, quite often among historical accounts, um, that those of the Virginia frontier, and by this I mean Lewis's Southern Division, that they're just itching to go fight an Indian war so that they can steal more land. And I don't think it's that straightforward. Did they want to expand westward? Yes, obviously, we know this. This is an aspect of colonialism. But as I've already discussed in a previous video, when we talked about some of the various treaties that had taken place during the 18th century, they thought the Indians had already ceded this land. And, and yes, we know in hindsight that not everyone agreed that there were disputes but as far as these people on the frontier were concerned, it wasn't the Shawnee preventing them from going west. It was the British government not allowing it. So if, if they're itching to fight anybody right now, it's not the Shawnee. Just putting that out there. Why would they be so anxious to go steal land that they think already belongs to Virginia? It doesn't make any sense. But, you know, to be on the safe side because of this letter, the, bro the brothers, they write home while they're finishing up their business in Williamsburg, and they ask that everyone just kind of put themselves on a posture of defense, you know, just keep an eye out, get prepared, just kind of, just in case, right? Um, because at the same time, we do have Logan raiding along the frontier, and it, it can't hurt to be careful. Another claim is that the Virginia House of Burgesses, they were just completely on board. They were just as excited about this Indian War as the frontiersmen were. Yeah. So, there's a problem with that. 
if that were the case, if the House of Burgesses was over here like, oh, yes, we can't wait, let's do this, let's authorize this, if that were the case, why did Governor Dunbar write a circular letter dated June 10th condemning the Virginia House of Burgesses for their failure to act regarding the Indian threat? You know what they did act on? What they found more important, more pressing than their own borders and the supposed threat there? The Boston Port. All the way up there in Massachusetts, that's what they were worried about right then. And so Dunmore dissolved the House of Burgesses because they stated their displeasure and their condemnation of the Boston Port Bill. Again, their complaints at this point are not with the Shawnee. Their complaints are with the British government. It is not rocket science. Then on June 22nd, you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna be discussing what were they thinking on the frontier, Colonel William Christian, who represents Fincastle County in the House of Burgesses, he writes a letter to Colonel William Preston, who is the county lieutenant for Fincastle County. And um, he says, quote, I received your letter yesterday with the extract from Connolly's letter, in which he observes that a party of Shawnee were gone out against the inhabitants. That, an intelligence from the Shawnee, must have been near a month ago, and of course, if true, they must have made the stroke by this time. As that is not the case, it seems more probable to me that the enemy would wait the resolutions of the Grand Council which was to be held." End quote. So they knew that the Shawnee leadership were going to be meeting. Why would the Shawnee try like jump into a war before this council had met? I mean, it didn't even make sense on the frontier. Then a bit further down in the letter, he says, quote, So desirous are some of them for an Indian war, though I can't help fearing that it is the most worthless and the men least to be depended on. End quote. Apparently, Colonel Preston had already voiced some of his misgivings questioning whether he could even call out the militia given that they hadn't actually been attacked yet. And what you're more likely to see quoted from him is the circular letter that Preston eventually sent out trying to call up the militia. And you know this letter, it's clearly calculated for a positive response from the men. He talks about the supposed benefits of an upcoming expedition, he talks about how it's an opportunity that they have so long wished for. This is what I see quoted. but. He didn't actually send that out until he was specifically ordered to raise at least 250 men, until he had received multiple communications about Dunmore's wishes. I'm not sure how much longer he could have gotten away with postponing this. So then we're going to make a big deal about his wording when he's already been told he has to do this. He has to get them to volunteer. How do you do that if you're not calculating your words? which does not mean he doesn't mean it, he may. I'm just saying it's a little bit more complex than that. It is not that straightforward. And the frontier leadership, they keep discussing problems all summer long. There's other things they're worried about. There's a scarcity of powder and lead. They can't find it. There's difficulty keeping the local forts manned. What are you gonna do? Are we gonna march all our men away and then they can't defend themselves back here at home? Um, and even if they try to do that, there's low recruitment in general, to the point that Andrew Lewis was afraid they'd have to institute a draft, which he didn't want to do. Um, and that all just makes me scratch my head. Where are these frontiersmen that are just so eager to go out and fight? Where did they go? Oh yeah, they're the men from around Fort Pitt. And that does not make the Southern Division out to be angels. I'm not trying to say that. Do not mistake me there. What I am saying is that they just, they're not half as eager for a war as they are made out to be. Around the time that the Southern Division is kind of finally getting their butts in gear, there are other things going on as well. Logan is still conducting his morning war raids along the frontier, and one of them takes place on August 7th, which is just days after the Battle of Akatamika further north. Now, Logan's party had been kind of out looking for targets. And the Lybrook family, which was, they lived kind of at the junction of Sinking Creek and the New River, they had been uh, staying in their blockhouse, which is kind of like a small-scale fort that would be built uh, by families on the frontier for defense. So even though they built it, you know, they had some kind of, their neighboring families would come over, and they're all just in this blockhouse trying to stay safe. 
Now, you can't do that indefinitely without going out of your mind, especially if you have kids. And if you have kids, you know they can drive you up the wall. I know because I have some. Um, but on that day, a Sunday, they decided to let the kids out to go play in the river. Uh, the adults were not there. I assume they were getting like chores done, taking care of animals, whatever they needed to be doing. The kids were allowed to go play. And if I get a little choked up in this, I just, I have a hard time whenever there's a story that involves kids. But, um, the kids ranged in age from infant to 14 years old. And Logan's party, which is about four men, uh, total, including Logan, they see their opportunity and they murder seven of these children. They take three boys as hostages. A few days later, two of the boys were able to escape, make their way away until they got help from Fort Bird and, and told their stories. But the Sinking Creek Massacre, it was right at the doorstep of the Southern Division. It was just miles, I want to say it was like seven or eight miles away from Preston's home. Um, so up until this point, if, if they had had their doubts about there being danger, well, Logan gave them some confirmation. Granted, they didn't know that Logan is working on his own. This is something that comes out in hindsight. But you hear about all these kids being slaughtered close to home and it, it hits you. So, Colonel William Preston, he writes to Pennsylvania County, which is their, their neighbors to the east over the Blue Ridge, and he demands that they send 100 militia with proper officers to help guard the frontier in the absence of all these other frontiersmen who are being sent on an expedition at Dunmore's orders. So, you know, they don't really want to make their, wor their families worry, but they're worried. You know, because they're leaving behind their wives, they're leaving behind their kids. That's a scary thought. So, they come to find out, and they kind of reassure their wives, too. They're like, you know, it's really only two small groups doing this raiding. It's probably not a big deal. Just stay alert. Moving on. Some Pennsylvanians in Westmoreland County, which is also near Fort Pitt, they, around the same time, had murdered a Lenape man named Joseph Whitey. And it sounds like they probably had something personal against him, but they took this as an opportunity. Like, you know, the current climate, everything going on, we could probably get away with this. And the perpetrators were named John Hinkson and James Cooper. But the Westmoreland County authorities, including um, a man named St. Clair, uh, author St. Clair, who went on to be a, a general in the revolution, they couldn't prove that Hinkson and Cooper committed the murder. Like, they knew he did, but they couldn't prove it. And then Wifey's body disappears. So any evidence they might have tried to get, it's gone. And incidentally, Governor Penn offers a reward for their capture. They can't get it, you know, and Penn's reaching out to Lenape to try to make it right. But John Hinkson, one of the perpetrators, he shows up a little while later joining Dunmore's army. Uh, you know, so if, if that gives you any idea of some of the men that decided to join up with Dunmore, like we already know that the Connolly's a piece of work, but there were a lot more that were just pieces of work. Um, and in September, we also know there was another situation where there were three unarmed Lenape men visiting um, someone nearby, and they got attacked as well, unarmed. So there's a lot of things simultaneously going on across different parts of the frontier and I don't want to highlight some of these things and not others and, and, and make it just seem very one-sided because it, it's not there is a lot going on also at the end of August that's when Governor Dunmore leaves Williamsburg and he marches toward Fort Pitt to rendezvous with the rest of the militia he's going to take charge of he also met with Deputy Indian Agent Alexander McKee and representatives of the Haudenosaunee, the Shawnee, and the Lenape. You know, they have like a, a brief council. And though in theory this meeting is supposed to preserve peace, Dunmore used the opportunity to, to level a bunch of disingenuous accusations against the Shawnee. And as we've covered, they, they really aren't even all that involved by this point, beyond their upper towns being attacked by McDonald's men. Dunmore, though, he claims that they never really buried the hatchet after French, the French and Indian War and Pontiac's War. 
He acts like they've been low-key perpetuating violence ever since, which really isn't true. Yeah, we have the occasions of small-scale violence, but everyone's part of that, white colonists included, and Dunmore kind of conveniently overlooks that. Um, so it's, it's very one-sided and obnoxious. And the Shawnee, they reply by saying, you know, yeah, maybe some of our foolish young men have done things here and there, but, quote, that tomahawk which we formerly held has been long since buried, and we have not since raised it, end quote. So, you know, the leadership are saying, no, we are not at war as a tribe. If we were, you would know, right? Um, and something I found interesting as well from my research, though the Shawnee couldn't really say it at this council, is that the Shawnee leadership believed the Ohio Haudenosaunee who were living among them were actually the ones responsible for a lot of this conflict that had been taking place. But the Haudenosaunee, you know, the Six Nations, they're a big tribe or rather group of tribes and you don't really want to upset them. So the Shawnee were kind of concerned about what would happen if they tried to force them out. And this is something that they can't say at the meeting because the Haudenosaunee are also present. But it's a sentiment that's recorded in uh, Moravian mission diaries that were only published in the last few years. And it's something that, you know, Shawnee visiting the village had confided in the missionary writing in this diary. So he records it. Um, regardless, it's... <sighs> It's very unlikely it would have even mattered if they had been able to explain this to Dunmore because Dunmore wanted this war like my kids want candy. At the end of the council, he basically says he's going to march down the Ohio River, kind of move forward with his plans. The Shawnee are welcome to meet up with him along the way to discuss this further, but, you know, he's going. And at this point, we're up to September of 1774. The next big thing in this story, which I will finally get to in the next video, is that Battle of Point Pleasant, which is often erroneously called the only battle of the war. Um, but it did have important ramifications. So if you've been enjoying this video so far, please let me know your thoughts in the comments below. You know, questions, concerns, observations, what have you. I'd love to hear it. Um, there's certainly a lot more that can be said. and. The one advantage I will say about writing an academic paper is that I can put in a bunch of footnotes to explain, you know, this thing over here, this thing over here, this thing over here, like, you know, all the side information. But in the videos, I'm really trying to stay on target and not get too sidetracked because then I'll never stop talking. Um, <laughs> so that, that kind of does make it different in how I have to present it. But if you have not subscribed yet, please go ahead and do that and like the video so that YouTube wants to present it to more people and, you know, we can get this history out there. Um, I, I will see y'all in the next video. Thanks, guys.